And that was something that was super new to me um, and something that, and then made me think, hmm, why don't we talk about race as a forefront of any organizing campaign, right? Because there are cultural differences and similarities that really matter to someone becoming, you know, building a relationship and building trust and all of that. And that just wasn't something prior to this that I, that really was ever at the forefront of any organizing conversation um, and any sort of organizing campaign. So I think this is such a critical topic and it's, it's going to be you know, sometimes a difficult one, complicated one, there's going to be, you know, different kinds of feelings here and there, but we're here to talk about all that. Um, and we have honestly the best crew to do that with. So just quickly, I'm going to introduce uh, our panelists, um, Terry, who's a longtime organizer, retired from organizing for UE, uh, will be one of our panelists in a a uh, good, great EWOC volunteer, uh, organizing volunteer. We have Amari, um, who recently helped organize their workplace, Tudor Associates with um, CWA Local. Um, and they're currently bargaining for a contract with their coworkers. Um, uh, and then we have Atulia, uh, who she's a rank and file worker at Chipotle and helped organize a union at her store at the Teamsters and has since then helped, you know, bring other Chipotle stores into the movement um, and is really dressed uh, a wonderful, wonderful person to have um, part of this Ewok family. So I'm just going to get right into it. Um, we're going to start. So how tonight is going to look, we're going to have a first round of pretty general, you know, maybe more broader questions to just get us warmed up on this topic. And then uh, we'll move into uh, some more targeted questions where actually all of our panelists are going to share, you know, personal stories, campaign stories, experiences that really underscore like, you know, uh, specific skills, like things that all of you on this call can take into the campaigns that you're working on as an EWOC volunteer, the campaigns you're working on as a worker out in your workplace, um, and actually start to utilize right away, right? Because that's how we build on the skills that we learn is actually being able to practice them um, out in the field. And so the second round is going to be more targeted questions. Um, and then we'll have, you know, just a kind of open conversation between the panelists um, that'll then flow into uh, more of an audience Q and A. So, um, and I, I don't know, Rue, are we inviting folks to put questions in the chat throughout this, and then we'll come back to them towards the end of the audience Q and A? Yeah, I think that's how we'll do it. Okay. Yeah. So if you all think of things as we're having discussions, um, feel free to just drop it in the chat, and then we'll come back to it towards the end. All right. So let's just start with the, I feel like the biggest question, it's probably going to have, you know, all kinds of answers, which is why is race not often at the forefront of an organizing campaign? Um, what do people think? Terry, Amaria, Tulia. Yeah, I'll talk about that. So we've been getting all this DEI training and everybody's a little self-conscious about uh, talking about these subjects. And I think that is to the detriment of our campaigns. Like, um, I, I just think it might be good to talk about why this is different from DEI. You know, I, I was involved in what was sort of like a premature DEI uh, training um, years ago where we had a group of a mixed group of people and we were talking about racism and it was really nice and it was kind of touchy feely. And then um, uh, people wound up saying things to each other, like, can I touch your hair? You know, and it was like, everybody loved it. It was very personal, but that's not what we're talking about here. We're talking about building a multiracial anti-racist labor movement and um so you know we have to kind of shed our self-consciousness about what we've learned about um uh, not saying the wrong thing we have to be more interested in getting to the real facts and we are in proving that we ourselves are good students of <laughs> how to talk and and um that might sound a little heretical but i think it's important Yeah, I absolutely agree with Terry. Um, and just to build off of that further, I think that throughout history, we've seen race and labor be treated in very particular ways. I think on the one hand, we see race 
on the one hand and labor on the other. So they're treated like they're these very distinct things that have no relation to one another. And history also shows us that at the same time, keeping those things distinct only benefits those who are in power, right? And I think with that in mind, we see almost like a trickle down from history where now today we still often see race as a very divisive thing. Um, whether it's socially in the sense that, you know, I'm talking to someone else and we're, race comes up and now I'm feeling uncomfortable to talk about it. Or maybe someone's uncomfortable talking to me about race and my experiences being black, et cetera. Um, and then I, was, I also think we see that politically too where if we want to see unity, we have to put all of our differences aside um, and come together, right? But if anything, I think that race and labor are extremely interconnected. Um, and it's definitely on us as organizers to help people see how if we are organizing together, then we are doing this together, right? Um, as opposed to letting race be left in the backseat. Yeah, I think something I'm picking up on is that, you know, from both of you is that this is, it's often not at the forefront of an organizing campaign because it's not a comfortable thing all the time for people to recognize. And I'm not just saying like talking about race is uncomfortable, but I'm saying people recognizing they don't know how to approach this question is uncomfortable, right? And so it's sort of this fear and discomfort. It's, am I saying the right thing? Is there a right thing that I can say? Am I treating this person correctly, right? Instead of just, um, you know, part of building an organizing campaign is coming together, having hard conversations. And if we're not able to have this side of a hard conversation, then we're not having the right conversations after all. And I think what Amari is saying also is just that it's not, it's, it is something that is used, you know, it's part of the fear and the discomfort of organizing that is used to divide people and make sure that folks feel like this is too hard of a thing to do. And so if it's not foregrounded as something in an organizing campaign is, look, there are going to be differences. We, you know, there are going to be people that look and grew up differently, and that's going to cause different, you know, cultural interpretation interpretations of this or that. If that's not just foregrounded as something that is a open discussion, then that becomes a sort of continuous wedge that the boss, you know, or whatever management campaign is able to really use. Um, and we know that fear is the dividing factor, right, to all of this. So uh, that is definitely what I'm hearing from both of those answers. I don't know, Atulia, if you had anything you wanted to add to that. Sorry, my camera is having some difficulties. No um, I think that's like really um, spot on and it does really become like kind of a thorny issue um, where people like will self-censor themselves a lot. But I feel like it is really important to emphasize that um, most people, um, I'm again trying to say this in a way that doesn't make me sound like a boomer. Um, but most people um will like really give you the benefit of the doubt. Um, and it's not and I, I'm not saying this from a boomer perspective, I'm saying this from a zoomer perspective. It's not like it is online, so to speak. Um, and so you definitely do have like a lot more benefit of the doubt to like ask people questions. Um if you are doing from like a place of like humility, um, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and there is, um, I think like a greater sense of like solidarity just by virtue of like the fact that you guys are coworkers. Um, and so you really see like discussions, I think of like race get really complicated when people are in like different societal positions, um, you know, like one has like power over the other. Um, but when you guys are coworkers, you have that aspect of the situation, like very, very level. Um, and so it becomes an aspect that you can like talk about and it should be talked about. Yeah. One thing it's also making me think of what you just said, Atulia, is just that, um, if we're having strong organizing conversations with our coworkers, right? Which means we're building trust, we're understanding their story, we're getting to the bottom of the root of their issues and their concerns, not just in the workplace, but just them as a person outside in life, then then, then the discomfort that comes with, oh, I might, maybe I'll say a wrong thing, or maybe this is not the right thing to do at the moment, that sort of fades away a little bit, right? It helps us like
because we have that if we're foregrounding all of this with you know we're having deep and good you know trusting conversations with our coworkers that move our campaign along then some of that sort of benefit of the doubt is built in to then you know uh, part of building a strong relationship um and i think that kind of takes me to the next question which is just how can an organizing campaign be strengthened when race, you know, be it racial tensions that exist in a workplace or a community is centered in an organizing, um, in an organizing campaign, I guess, or specifically you can talk about an organizing conversation. Um, how does a campaign benefit from actually having that front and center? You know, I'd actually like to talk about that. Um, because um, I, there was one organizing campaign, which was my introduction to the labor movement that uh, totally changed my life. And I think it's worth looking at a little bit, even though it was a long time ago. Um, back in the early 70s, um, my partner and I went to work in a big factory in Chicago. And uh, it was very diverse racially, lots of white workers, lots of black workers, some Latinos and some people from just about every corner of the globe. And it was um, very errantly, shockingly, blatantly discriminatory in their hiring practices and, and, and just about it any way you can think. So we were very naively, we went into this, you know, oh, we're gonna organize. And we identified two um, black workers that were obviously leaders, had a lot of respect and a lot of following. And we sort of like, how would you like to be part of an organizing project? And they were real straight with us. They said, look, you cannot win at this place unless you have the white workers involved. And um, so your, your challenge is to get the some white workers to buy in to uniting with the black workers to to do something and they were very very straightforward and we were very ready to hear what they said so we kind of you know we kind of put ourselves to the task now the white workers at that place were um confused and I think you may find this more often than not. On the one hand, they were really pissed off at the factory because they're underpaid and is a dirty and kind of nasty place to work, but, but they did have positions that were better than the positions that the black workers had. And they were kind of friends with, some of them were kind of friendly with the bosses. And so they were, they had a divided, uh, feeling about about the job. And so our job was to try to recruit some of these white workers to see that the only way they could ever make their work life better was to stick with the black workers and fight for it. And um, it was a long, I'm not going to tell you the whole story. It was too long to tell, but I just want to tell one little part of it, which is at the um, towards the beginning, we felt that we needed to bring people together because, you know, we needed to build trust. The black workers who had agreed to help us needed to, to trust that we were working to bring the white workers in and the white workers need to trust us that, that we weren't crazy. So, so we had a party um, and when we got people, I just want you to picture this. People coming to this party, it, it was probably the first mixed party that a lot of people had ever been to. And for about a week before the party, some of these white workers that we had recruited to come were saying, oh my God, if I go to that neighborhood, my car will probably get uh, burglarized. And then, oh my God, what if some black guy wants to dance with my wife? And I seriously, these are these are literally things that people said, but they did come, you know, everybody came and they had a wonderful time and they, it was like, that was our kickoff. That was what built the beginnings of trust. And so I really can't emphasize enough, bring people together in whatever way 
be don't be afraid to be explicit about the racial uh, divisions and how to uh, how we want to overcome them because that is how you build trust. You're not manipulating people. You're explaining it to people. So, Amari, I saw you muted. You want to add something to that? Oh, sure. Um, well, actually, I think what I was about to say, mm -hmm. I think Terry's story really is like the perfect kind of example to kind of tie it all together. Um, going back to the original question, just like at the end of the day, if we are engaging in an organizing campaign, we are doing so to build collective power, right? Like we are coming together, unifying for a variety of reasons to uh, improve our workplace, improve our conditions, our living conditions, et cetera, right? Notice <laughs> that it's called collective power, right? If we don't have the collective, then we don't have the power, which sounds like so silly simple, but it's true, right? And so it's like, if we are not addressing very real things like race that affect not only how you navigate the workplace, but the world, how are we able to come together to build that collective power, right? Um, and so if anything, addressing race, being explicit, being willing to be uncomfortable very clearly strengthens the organizing campaign because it helps you build that real, true collective power. Um, yeah. Yeah, definitely. Um, this also helps us think a little bit. So taking it into starting, uh, maybe inviting all of you to start to share just some like actual, you know, skills. And, and the way I, I find I like to learn about these things is like, okay, what are things that you've incorporated into an organizing conversation, right? For example, I mean, of all of the folks on here, most of you have taken the uh, organizing training that EWOC offers. Um, and it is true that the way that we structure our organizing conversations, the way that we train them, there really isn't anything that's explicitly, you know, about race in them, right? It's, it's sort of like, okay, what are your issues? If they're, and they're usually wages or benefits, okay? And then you agitate on those issues, right? But what, I guess the question that I want to move into is, you know, the boss's message that gets carried on a lot of the times is like, there's, there's two, there's one that's like, we're a family, you know, like this is going to uh, sort of build division in our workplace. And part of that is, is going to pit people against each other, even though the boss is really at the end of the day, the one doing that. And so there's the boss's message. And if we don't face these difficult conversations and talk about the differences and the tensions that exist in the workplace, then we are just giving, you know, we are just giving more fuel to that boss's message. So I'm, I'm curious to hear from uh, you all. And I think Atulia, you might have something uh, good to say about this question, which is just like, what are the ways you've, sh you've shifted in your own campaign, um, your approach to whether it's an organizing conversation, whether it's sort of like an agitational conversation, what are, you know, specific ways that you you have shifted your approach to resist against this um, this kind of uh, you know discomfort and the sort of bosses uh, fear and all of that. Um, I think okay, I'm gonna try to word this carefully, but um, I think a lot of people of color, whether or not they like. Um, have an idea about like racial capitalism or not um, they have like kind of like an innate sense of like okay like white people are the boss you know so to speak um, and that is like something that can be like really radicalizing um, I remember this one time um, so it's like a, a side story like an anecdote but um, I was outside the office and I was opening um with three other black coworkers in the morning. Um, and they were just talking in the office. Um, and they were like, oh, there's like no speaker today. Okay, just go and get one. Um, and they went, go and get one. Um, there's no white people around, you'll be fine. Um, and then like, I may accidentally made a sound out in the hallway and they were like, who's there? And they peeked down and they were like, oh, it's just a Tulio, you're good. Like go and get the speaker. Um, and so there is like a really like level of trust, I think, that comes with um, POC workers. Um, 
as well as when we were kind of talking to people, we we're doing the classic 70-30 rule, we did discover that um, this kind of concern about like racism was a big issue in the workplace. Um, and so one of the specific things which um, I was did not um, realize until um, a few black coworkers told me is that at Chipotle, they have a tendency to um, stick black coworkers on the grill, which is like one of the worst positions. Um, or they have a tendency um, to not like let black workers like do the frontline jobs. Um, so they'll put them like either um, like doing dishes or grill or like prep or something. Um, and so having like conversations like that, um, it becomes like really easy to sort of like shift that into um, like a discussion about how we're gonna how we're gonna organize against this. Like how um, can't would do you think like it would be effective if you went in there um, by yourself? Or, like do you think it would be effective if like we all uh, went in there, um, et cetera, et cetera? I hope that makes sense. It makes a whole lot of sense. I mean, the um, and I, I would furthermore say, like, when we're starting to organize a place that part of our initial campaign prep should be to do a race analysis of what what's going on. And that may not be that apparent to to us white people because it's we're probably not on the short end of it. But the, if there are people of color in the workplace, they have probably already made that analysis and can share it with you if you show interest. And um, th th that whole thing about being on the grill or being on the dishwasher, that that's that's part and parcel of what we need to know, you know, in an organizing campaign, just like front of house, back of house, um, mm -hmm. you know, wh whatever the workplace is. Yeah, um, what that's making me think of also is, is you know, I mentioned earlier that part of when at my oh. union, uh, yeah, part of part of when we chart a new nursing home, you know, we do have, we do uh, note people's races. And I think what actually that opens up is that, you know, we'll get people who come to us and it's like, okay, the Puerto Ricans do not get along with the Spanish or like the West Africans do not get along with the, you know, the American folks or whatever. And then you know, these conversations just kind of flow out. And it's it's a little awkward sure, at first. You're like, well, why don't you guys get along? But it, what it actually helps us to do as organizers and and, and it helps the, the workers at this nursing home to do is like, well, why aren't we getting along? Like what types of divisions exist in our workplaces that make it so that we cannot get along? Is it that, you know, is it that, well, most of the dietary department, most of the maintenance department are Puerto Ricans versus most of the nursing department are... West Africans, right? And that's gonna, that division is, there's a reason for it. There is sort of an enemy, right? Like it helps us to then get, bring the workers together to understand, okay, who is the person that's actually making the decisions that's affecting our ability to get along with our coworkers and thus have like a, you know, a good working workplace where we actually have a voice and can change things. Like it helps that kind of initial conversation of just recognizing, okay, this is a, you know, these are differences that we have and uh, the boss benefits from us, you know, um, kind of not recognizing them. And how does the boss do that? Um, and it helps us have that like boss conversation, I think, in my experience. So I'm, I feel like Terry and Atulia, both of what you were saying made me think of, you know, the ways in which just naming it out front um, is going to help. And, and it also helps us be like, well, we're not going to get the Puerto Rican leader in dietary to go talk to the nurses, right? Because that's not necessarily the best leader um, in that situation. But we might get, you know, someone who crosses paths with each other more to have a first joint conversation. So yeah. Oh, Terry, go ahead. Oh, no, that's okay. Oh, okay. Uh, let's move. Well, let's move on to, you know, we've been talking a lot about how race is a really difficult issue often to tackle. But I want to hear, and Amari, I know you're going to start us off on this, is like, when's the time you've been able to successfully actually center it as like the main organizing issue in a campaign? Um, 
and what was difficult in the process of, of, of centering that? Like what sorts of pushback, what sorts of tensions uh, appeared and what did you successfully do to kind of move past that? Yes, so as it was briefly mentioned during the little introduction of me, I am a tutor. And so at my company, Tutor Associates, it is predominantly white. Like there are some people of color, but it's predominantly white, all right? Um, and so as we were starting to organize, of course, we were doing our one-on-ones, all of that good stuff. Um, and it became clear that even though there were only a few like people of color on staff, that discrimination and particularly racism was still absolutely an issue that people are experiencing, um, including myself. Um, definitely experienced good amount of issues <laughs> with clients in terms of making assumptions about how much I know about a given subject or going to like a tutor's home, I'm not tutor's home, a client's home to tutor them and the doorman questioning me aggressively, asking why I'm here, not believing me that I'm a tutor, right? So the racism is real. The racism was there, right? Um, and of course, ideally, racism and discrimination in and of itself is a huge issue that we can um, mobilize on. But again, I had a predominantly white or have a predominantly white workplace. Mm -hmm. And so there was an, it's the, almost an issue of, okay, how do I balance the fact that this is a very real experience that me and my coworkers are experiencing while also being aware that if I'm trying to build and if we are trying to build this collective power, then not everyone, because they're either white or just experience different forms of discrimination that aren't racism, are going to be willing to rally around and put themselves at risk for in unionizing. And so I think what it kind of came down to in my experience is that we kind of found solution in two different ways. The first one being, of course, discrimination and racism is a safety issue, right? It's not just on the onus of like black coworkers or people of color in general that are, they're just experiencing racism, right? If I'm experiencing racism at my workplace, that is impacting my ability to do my work, like it, it affects my mental health, etc. So first it was a matter of almost like reframing it so that it fits under a grander network of issues. So it's not just racism, we're talking about safety and racism is a huge part of making sure that all of us are feeling safe, right? And then also I think it was a matter of doing another kind of reframing where it's like, okay, I'm experiencing racism in my workplace. Why is this happening? Of course, because people have prejudice, but also because my boss has all the power and they're allowing this issue to persist, right? It's my boss with all the power deciding, okay, I'm not letting, I'm not letting this client go. We're just gonna like give the racist client to another tutor, right? And so reminding everyone, those who experience racism and those who don't, why are we doing this in the first place? Because of the fact that there is this power dynamic in our workplace that makes it unbearable for all of us, right? And so it kind of goes back to even what, I mean, all of us have been talking about and something I talked about at the beginning too, that again, at the end of the day, all of this stuff is interconnected, right? We can't have one without the other. Um, and so making sure that even if you can't experience solidarity because you experience the same thing, you're able to meet each other in the middle, kind of, um, and see, even though I can't, I don't experience this, I still want to fight for my coworkers because I might experience this in a different way. Or I see how at the root, it's our structure of our workplace and frankly, society, um, that keeps this, um, that allows this to happen. Um, so I hope that made sense. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. Um, two things that I want to draw out and, and kind of pitch back to you as a question, Amari, is just um, it's such a what you're saying opens up a world of sort of um, new ways to look at this thing that we hear a lot in organizing training and organizing, which is like the widely felt, deeply felt issue, right? And it, and it, we always are, are saying this, we need to identify the widely felt issue, right? And how can we identify a widely felt issue if the majority of a workplace is white? And, you know, a, a very pertinent issue that you're feeling and you want to be centering is an issue 
you know, rooted in, in, in race. And so that just opens up, you know, my mind. So that story about how we can think about that. And another, a question, a follow-up question I wanted to ask you in that situation is, you know, a lot of the times we find that if you're one of the only people of person of color, right, a lot of the times a woman of color in a workplace, you are automatically, or an organizing campaign, right, in an OC, you are automatically pitched as like, okay, I'm going to have Amari speak on this. I'm going to have Amari organize around this. Amari is the only one that can have organizing conversations around this race issue, right, because, uh, because I don't know as much as Amari does, right, uh, and uh, I, if I were a white man, I'm not a white man, but if I were a white man, I would be like, oh, I don't know as much. So Amari should have this conversation, right? Um, that happens a lot. And it makes it so that it can't ever become the central issue that everyone is organizing around. Uh, did you feel like that ever happened in your situation? And if not, great, wonderful. Uh, do you have, you know, any thoughts on how you might have fought back, not fought back or just like worked around that? Or if anyone else has any uh, thoughts about that too, not just to Amari. Yeah, I. that's a great question. Um, and while generally speaking, I have certainly had my fair share of feeling very tokenized in various spaces, I would say that I was very lucky in my campaign to where maybe at first I was one of the few people who were who was speaking up about the fact that racism was an issue, but I think over time, as we continue to build that collective power and solidarity with one another, it also became clear to my coworkers that like, right, this is like racism and discrimination is a piece of a puzzle and we're all involved in that puzzle. Um, and so I will say that I think without the, the degree of care, uh, detailed oriented organizing and our emphasis on like educating not only like who's on our organizing committee but the entire unit that I think it could have looked a lot differently um but I think we were very on top of making sure like kind of with what I was saying earlier that even if it is a small number of people experiencing a given thing that is an interconnected issue um so I will say with that I would definitely recommend others think about it in that way too. Like, how do I ensure that it doesn't just fall on the one black coworker? How do we make it clear that we all have a stake in this, even if I'm not experiencing it directly through something like organizing, not organizing, I meant educating and organizing together. So anybody who is running an organizing campaign that had somebody that could explain things like Amari does, oh man, it'd be so important, but that doesn't let us off the hook because not everybody is gonna be real um, articulate and describing the effects of racism as what you just did. And so if all of us are being alert to what other people are experiencing, and this also goes for Spanish speaking workers who are really sidelined if their English is not as good as the English of other people and there's, they depend on Spanish and they talk to their friends in Spanish and, and there's apt to be a certain paranoia towards people speaking Spanish. And then in addition to that, people don't know what they have to say. And, and so I, I'm gonna say that I think that um, those of us who are white, who are involved in organizing have to, we are not off the hook, you know, to be looking for these issues. And also, hey, if you are wanting to be an organizer for life, as I hope you are, um, learn Spanish. Even if you can. <laughs> I'm trying, Terry. <laughs> even if you can, even if you can only just say buenos dias, you know, <laughs> That's better than not saying buenos dias. And if you if you work on it, and if you try to talk to people, and particularly if you talk to people who mainly only speak Spanish, you will find yourself forced to use whatever Spanish you have, and it will get better. And And it's just such a wonderful thing to be able to include everybody in the conversation. So I, I'm, I'm gonna 
you know, just watch telenovelas at night. Every night, go home and watch telenovelas. Your Spanish will get better. <laughs> um, one quick thing that I wanted to mention, because I, I, I forgot to earlier, is that I think, Amaria, something you mentioned in your story, too, that I found really important is that it seemed like you were all of you and your coworkers were able to actually frame this issue of racism that you were experiencing around the work, like what what is important to you and your coworkers about the work, right? Like you guys are teaching and tutoring other children and people and that work, you know, deserves, you know, we it like because of the work you're doing is touching different people, right? Like I can talk about this in terms of our, our union where we always say you're, we're providing services to people, right? It means that if we can't have these forefront conversations about the racism that we're receiving, then we can't provide the best quality care, right? The best type of tutor, the best type of education, if we can't even feel like this workplace is promoting that, right? So like, it seemed that you and your coworkers effectively grounded it in something that everybody does deeply feel, which is like they're doing this work because they have some care for the for the service they're providing or like the the care they're providing. Um, um, so I think that's it's just an important, I think, thing for me to think about too. Um, and just, I think moving forward a little bit to think about, you know, can does, does, does any of you have a time where, um, a very explicit, explicit issue around race was actually ignored. Um, and how did that affect the organizing campaign? How, you know, where did tensions start to come up? Um, and yeah, just like, can, can anyone here talk about uh, a time where you felt like that was ignored and what it did? Um, I think this is like a relevant, um, thing. Um, and I think this is like important. It's one of the things I was like, I wrote down to like definitely say, um, because I think it's like, like very like Ewok specific. Um, but we were joining, um, the Teamsters Union. Um, and I don't know how it is in other places, but I feel like this is like a kind of like a national Teamster stereotype. Like they were pretty white. Um, and so um, they had like a lot of, um, I don't want to say like blind spots, but they just hadn't like really thought about like how race could be like used in like workplace organizing a ton. Um, and there were like these um, instances, two instances uh, that really like stuck out to me as an example of this. One was um, we had kind of like brought up to them this issue of like, oh, uh, like in our workplace, it seems like, um, people of color, black people especially, are like getting put in like certain positions in the restaurant um, and getting like mistreated in certain ways. Um, and um, our organizer went, wow, let me just say, whoever does that is going down a, a dark, dark path. Um, and that was like kind of like the extent of like what he had to offer us on that. It's a great quote. But um, the other issue about this is, you know, we... This, we were like organizing this union like 2022, right? So, like two years after the BLM stuff, um, like the mass uprisings that happened, you know, across the country. And I think, like, what's really important about those is like, um, you know, these are like record turnout protests and stuff, but they're all like workers too, right? So, like, they all go back to like a workplace after. Um, and we had this like high school, um, uh, this like black high school student who like works at Chipotle. Um, and he has these like Crocs and they have like a, you know, like how people put stuff in the Crocs, right? Um, I'm like looking down at his feet one time, there's like a bunch of minion stuff um, and then a BLM like Croc thing in there as well, right? Um, so um, his name is Herb. We bring him to like meet one of these organizers um, and the Teamster organizers starts talking about how like the Teamsters represent all sorts of um, people like, oh, all sorts of city employees, blah, blah, blah. Can people see where this is going? Um, and then he brings up, yeah, like we represent, you know, every police officer is protected um, in a team state union and stuff like that. Um, and Herb took this in stride and stuff, like real credit to him. 
Um, but I think like where Ewok would really like, come into this situation is, you know, Ewok is often like organizing these workers before they get put in contact with a union um, and sort of like, um, I hate to say like almost like inoculating them um, against like certain like blind spots that you might have. Um, and to also let them know that they can like work with the union to like fix that. So as soon as that meeting ended, for instance, I like talked to the Teamsters, I was like, um, you know, like police unions, like not really popular, like among our generation and stuff. Um, and they weren't defensive about it at all. Like they were completely understanding. They're like, okay, like we won't bring that up. And that is like real organizer mentality, right? Um, so I think it's like important, especially like if you are like a rank and file like worker in the workplace to um, know like what the issues are in your workplace, um, but then also um, know what the kind of like racial issues are in this union that you're trying to join or like have like a sort of peripheral idea um, and be ready to have to be the person to give like the most um, fulfilling answer to a coworker of color um, if your union probably won't be able to do it. Yeah, that's such a great, great answer, Julia, I, especially because we're all here as Ewok organizers and volunteers. And I think part of what's amazing about what we do is um, well, part of what's not amazing is that when a lot of our campaigns go into unions, yeah, what happens when your union is just not on program about all this, like not on message about this, which is honestly most most unions in the country, unfortunately. And I think the other amazing thing that we do here is that we prepare workers to be fighting and organizing like a union far ahead of when they actually start start you know get recognized or even find their sort of local that they affiliate with and i think that we should take all of us here as organizers should take on part of this responsibility of being like hey if once you know you get affiliated and the union is not on program with x y and z you should use that fire and that fight that you built up when you're building your union right and continue to you know shift the conversation at your local or shift the the discussion there. And that is like totally something that we all as Ewok volunteers should continue to empower. And why we're having a call like this is that we need to first start to have this, you know, language among all of us um, to be able to do that and to have that confidence. Um, Joe, I see your hand. I also know that Rue uh, got an audience question um, that was related in some ways to Atulia's comment. So Bru, do you want to go first and then Joe or? Yeah, let me just, uh, let me ask this question. So Kirby asked a great question in the chat. Um, he said, I'm organizing in a union that's mostly white men and the union operates on racist principles working inside, um, like within the union. And there's a lot of this magical thinking that membership in a union kind of cleans away any ra racism and sexism that's there, which is, and I think, uh, Kirby just wanted to put this question um, to to the panelists. How do you deal with that kind of magical thinking? Okay, so sorry. I want to make sure I got this question right. Is the question, um, like, how do you deal with, like, the magical thinking of, okay, this is, like, a racist union, um, and, um, oh, but, like, having membership be added to it, or, like, having the membership, like, take care of it will be, like, the solution? I um I think this is like a question someone else would probably answer, but my knee jerk for this is um that yeah, there's gonna be like struck it, it's it's okay, so my knee jerk is that this is gonna be like a different conversation, um, depending on if you're organizing a union or if like the union's like already organized and you are like fighting um to like improve it. If you're organizing a union, um, this sounds like really evil, but what I would like really focus on is like unions are like democracies, um, you know, like, um, and like any democracy, there's like issues, but like, um, I guess like it is kind of like engaging in like magical thinking, but like, um, we can like make democratic pushes to change the situation, like once we unionized, um, so we would not only have more power like in the workplace, but like in the union too. Um, the um but once you um are actually in a union that's like a very different conversation um and it probably involves um just like 
the very hard work of like okay like mapping like okay like who has like the ability to make these decisions like in this union structure like are there any elections at all um who can like be pressured to like get to listen to us to, like fix this et cetera et cetera Um, yeah, I'd just like to maybe add to that 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 um you know as Ewok organizers like people are building up their own sort of groups that have their own identity and part of that identity we hope and and I think we should try to really structure in is to be anti-racist. So among ourselves and you know uh, more broadly. And so if that is what people have kind of learned to identify with their union movement, then if they join a union where people are being racist, they have tools already that they've been using to deal with that. And I, I think that that's something that we shouldn't be afraid to do. Um, Joe, I wanted to pitch it back to you. Um, I know you had your hand up. Thank you. Yeah, um, this is very this is very good. Um, I just wanted to suggest that, <clears throat> you know, a, a couple of things. One is I think the most common, you know, the question you originally posed, uh, the most common way that comes up is in all white or overwhelmingly white union sponsored gatherings of various sorts, whether executive board meetings or whatever. Uh, and uh, and nobody brings up that fact when the workforce is not that way. You know, uh, that's the biggest, you know, the, the, the silence is the biggest thing, the biggest single thing. And just like when you're organizing, fear is always the biggest thing. <laughs> you know, it's like a law of nature in contemporary U.S. Um, and, and then one step beyond that, it seems like, I mean, it's important to bring that to people's attention. Uh, and but but I think when people are trying to call out some aspect of of conscious or unconscious, uh, uh, you know, institutional racism or individual racism within the within the context of a union or a union organizing committee or a pre-union organizing committee, it's really important if people can avoid being the one person doing it, the only one. And it's especially hard if that one person is a person of color themselves, but it's hard if it's a white person too. If, I mean, I think in general, if stuff can be brought up in a collective manner by more than one person, that really makes a huge difference. And that's a rule for any of the union work we do anyway. You know, you mm -hmm. try to avoid being a lone ranger. You try and always look for a partner to do anything. And I think that's especially important for these kind of, you know, really, you know, for, mo for most people, very touchy issues, most white people, especially. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that actually, Joe, helps a lot to look at the two other questions that came in, which I think are both great. Um, so, uh, Tulia, did you have a direct response to Joe or to one of those questions? Um, I do not. Sorry. Oh, go. Is it was it just a? Do you have a separate question? No, I just wanted to um kind of talk about like two points that happened in sure. the union campaign. But I know like we're ending soon, and I've like already talked a lot. So. Um. Well, I, I, I'm thinking. Do you, does the, do the examples that you're bringing up, could they be helpful in answering any of these two? I just want to make sure we're getting somewhere with the two questions that came in. One is just if the early organizing team is less diverse than the overall workplace, are there any best practices to avoid assumptions or inc inc incorrect conclusions? And then the second one I think is about how do we convince minority workers that it's possible to build unity with other workers who are in better positions than them? Because um, there's a lot of, you know, it, uh, Gershom is saying that sometimes uh, black workers are often more militant and organized and also felt that white workers in better pay positions wouldn't stick up for them. So there's a sort of in, inherent distrust. I don't know, Atulia, if any of the examples you're thinking about sort of answers any of that, but 
feel free to share them and then we can um, go into these next two questions. Um, yeah, I think they kind of do, but indirectly. I'll like lay on my cousin <laughs> table very indirectly. No worries. Um, so if it's okay, um, one thing I want to talk about is at Chipotle, we had, um, it was like an, when we came down for the election, right? Um, there were 11 um, yes people and then three no people. Um, and I think like the two no votes, two no votes, um, Whitney and Juan are like very, I think like characteristic of like how like race is like used to divide like an organizing campaign. Um, one with um, Juan, no one on the organizing committee. So I, I'm hoping this is like kind of answering this question. No one on the organizing committee spoke Spanish, right? Like going back to Terry's other thing. Um, I had tried to learn Spanish um, in college and in high school. I was really bad at it. Um, uh, and the other organizing committee members um, were white um, and never like had to for any reason. Um, and this Juan was actually someone who signed a union card initially, um, but when they brought the union busting consultant in, um, they were very smart and they brought in a bilingual union busting consultant. Um, and so in the process of like these like hours long talks that he was having in these one on ones, um, he became a no vote because like there was someone who could like sit down, like really talk with him, like answer his questions, et cetera, et cetera, well, answer his questions. Right. The other no vote was Whitney. Um, Whitney is a white woman coworker um, who no one wanted to talk to um, because she had a reputation for being racist. Um, and that is like very fair, but very like predictably because no one talked to her, um, she became like a no vote in this um, union campaign. Um, and what is really bad about the situation or like really good, depending on how you look on it is Whitney and Juan still work there and now they are like pro union people, right? Um, so it really is like an issue of communication in those two situations when we just had like a lot more time to talk with them, sit down with them when they eventually had like workplace issues, um, they became pro union like that. Um, but I feel like the lasting lesson is like, you really do have to be like plugged in to your coworkers, and there really has to be this like element of communication, um, because and if you have like a coworker who has like a reputation for being racist, um, sorry, like one of your white coworkers has to like suck it up and like go talk to them. Um, this is kind of like a like a inverse of like what Wen was saying um, to Amari about like this idea of you know you get these like questions of race. Um, and it's like really easy just like punt it over to like the people of color, like the women of color to like talk about, like have these organizing questions. Um, um, and I really like, we should be like um, mindful of that. But when it comes to like racists, um, that it really is fair to just like punt over to your white coworkers um, to have that discussion instead. Um, and the last thing I wanna say is on an optimistic note, um, our union buster, the two tactics they use that I felt like really was like, well, you're really seeing the whole gamut of what they can do here is they brought up Teamster leadership. So they were like, okay, Teamster leadership is very white, while Chipotle corporate leadership is very diverse. Um, which one do you feel like more represents you? Um, very evil or classic. Um, the second one was they would target coworkers who had language barriers, as you can tell by the Juan situation. So in the Juan situation, they were successful, but um, Chipotle has this um, like a big demographic of Chipotle are these like um, Indian moms because there's like a Indian community that's like kind of close by Chipotle. And so like a lot of Indian moms work at Chipotle, um, which is very sweet um, for me. And so um, they were trying to target these Indian moms in the same way they were trying to target Juan because they have a language barrier. Very fortunately for me, um, my mom speaks like Tamil and Telugu. Um, and so she was able to talk with these Indian moms and like help me have those like union organizing conversations when they got invited over to dinner, right? Um, but you really have to be very like on top of the language stuff when you're organizing. 
um, which is like a real weakness for me because I don't think I could say, learn a second language to save my life. Um, but if you're me in that situation, you have to find someone who can and does. Yeah, well, what it seems like it, it this shows is just it made you a much more creative, good, deeper organizer. <laughs> like you were thinking about, okay, I have a problem. I need to solve it. And how am I going to organize my coworkers to, you know, face this issue? And really what it, what it, what I, what I hear is just, this is a much, you know, you're, you're, uh, skilling up basically like organizing skills, um, and, and being sort of asking folks to step up and, and really hone in on them. Um, so I think that's a great example of that. Um, we're going to stay a few minutes late later. And I just want to name that because I think we're having a really great discussion and I would really be sad to cut it off. And I also see really two great questions. Um, so we're going to stay a few minutes later. I hope everyone can stay on. Um, uh, and let's move. I think what Atulia is saying helps me go to Michael's question, which is if the early organizing team is less diverse than the overall workplace, are there any best practices to help avoid assumptions? Um, I have a quick thing. I have a quick answer to this, which is just we should try to build diverse OCs. <laughs> um, and I think that that's ultimately, and if we aren't, if we are having trouble building diverse OCs, we should ask the rest of the OC, why are we having trouble recruiting people of color onto our OC if our workplace does not look like this? Uh, so that's my quick answer to that. I just feel like that is the baseline of what we should be doing is that our workplace should be reflective, our OC should be reflective of our workplace. But in the cases that that isn't happening, or, you know, we've moved further along, we have an OC already, how, what are ways to avoid assumptions or reaching incorrect conclusions? Does anyone have a quick, quick answer to that? So it seems like um, Gershon's question and Michael's question are sort of like inverse of each other. Mm -hmm. One is where you've got, a, um, I think, where, where you have like a white committee, but the people of color have not flocked to it. How do you correct that? And the other is, what do you do if your workplace, if the people of color are ready to move and the white workers do not see any connection? So they're they're like the the inverse of each other. But I would say about the question of the white workers that are more privileged, I people may disagree with this, but I think if they don't have any issues, if they are just hunky-dory with everything, if they do not have issues with any of the benefits or anything or any of the treatment or anything, you may have a hard time with them. <laughs> but that should not prevent you from trying to explore that because usually there are issues. There are issues in any workplace that is non-represented. They don't have something. So um, th that is what you can do. Now with the question of the, the white OC that just can't seem to make, um, you know, can't make connection with people of color. I think that's, you know, it's really a different problem. And I would really encourage people not to name themselves as having an OC until they've had pretty, exhaustive efforts to make it multiracial. I think it's much harder to do it after you've started. And I'll tell you a couple of reasons why I've seen this. You know, like um, one is you just have your comfort level. You, you set up a certain way of operating and your comfort level is um, th the way you set it up. And then it's harder for people who are not part of the same Let's say you set up having Zoom meetings and people don't have a computer or they don't have, you know, internet capabilities. Well, then what are you going to do? They can't come to the meeting. So that was a problem in the way that meeting was set up in the first place. And um, yeah, I just think... Um, the, just doing what seems natural and simple is not always accessible to the people that you're trying to reach. And you, you should ha try to have really good conversations with people before you, before you set something up that they're not a part of. For sure. I know I see people are kind of 
moving out. So I want to make sure that, um, Patrick, you get a chance to, or everyone gets a chance to say any closing thoughts. Um, uh, I think one quick closing thought to Terry's comment that I have is just, um, it, a lot of organizing is about appealing to people's self-interest. What do this, what, you know, this person, what did, what do they gain to, uh, you know, what do they stand to gain in this situation? And the only reason, the only way we can get to someone's self-interest is to buy, by having deep enough conversations when we're understanding their story and what moves them and what they care about. Um, and that I feel like is the ultimate sort of organizing fundamental that I keep thinking, going back to every single time there's a challenge. It's just that, am I understanding this person's, what moves them to get up every day and do this stuff, right? It may not be the thing we expect, but there are things. Um, so that would be my closing thought to that. Um, anyone else want to share any closing thoughts before we wrap up? I hope this is just the beginning of a conversation. Yeah, I, I wasn't going to contribute to anything that hasn't already be, been said, the wonderful things y'all have said. So I just want to thank y'all so much. Thank you for staying a few minutes after for posterity because we recorded it. I think it was totally worth it. Um, what I was going to share is just as far as Ewok is concerned, we are having another event at the end of March that is going to be similarly themed. This one was more geared towards like practical, actually directly in the workplace organizing. Um, and with that in mind, um, you know, we're going to send this out so people will see this. But, um, you know, my expectation is that when I check in with people, I want to be having this conversation with our volunteers about, you know, how is this conversation going in your campaigns? And and not to force it in any way. I think that's one thing I took away out of this conversation is that we want people to address concrete facts of a workplace situation, not to force it and then not to hide it either way. I think those are overcorrections in either direction. Um, so I challenge people who are volunteer organizers, or if you're organizing your workplace to really took what, take what you learn tonight from these folks and who shared their experience with us, um, and apply it to the campaigns we're working on. And the expectation at Ewok is that we are going to talk about this, um, and, and address it when it's necessary, um, and not shy away from it. Cause it's the only way we're going to be able to really effectively organize. So that's all I had. I think we're, we're good. Um, I, I guess I'll be the one to close us out. Thanks everybody. Have a great night. And uh, I'll send the recording out here um, in, a, in a few days. And I just wanted to say thank you so much to our panelists and to one for doing an incredible job facilitating. This was such a great discussion. Um, and just quickly, Amari, Atulia, Terry, any closing thoughts just from our panelists who are amazing, wonderful? Uh, thank you guys for organizing this. Uh, we went when. Likewise, and thank you, Atuli and Amari, for making awesome comments. Seconding what was already said, thank <laughs> y'all so much for having me and for all of you for listening. Yeah, folks, please send thoughts to Patrick or, or whoever, Rue, um, about other ways we can have this conversation uh, constantly yes. about this. I would please. love that. Please, um, Patrick at workerorganizing.org. We're in Slack, but I think part of that conversation is we want everybody to participate. So if you have ideas, please. Um, okay, I'm going to hit the end meeting officially. Bye-bye. Bye, guys. Good night.